And our speaker this morning is Colonel Jeffrey Williams, U.S. Army retired. He has flown on four space shuttle missions to the International Space Station. And having spent 534 days in space, Colonel Williams holds the record of the longest time in space for an American man. And that's a little bit of a qualified record, you notice, longest time in space for an American man. Colonel Williams graduated from the United States Military Academy at West Point, served more than 27 years in the Army. He holds a bachelor's degree from West Point, master's and aerospace engineering degrees from the Naval Postgraduate School, a master's degree from the Naval War College, Colonel Williams and his lovely wife, Anna Marie, have two children, five plus grandchildren on, five plus grandchildren, five and counting. There's the sixth one on the way. And some people say that to believe the Bible, to believe in creation, you've got to check your brain at the door. No. Going into the church, no. Here is a Christian brother with a couple of master's degrees that believes the Bible, believes God's account of creation. And we're pleased to have you, Colonel Williams. Thank you, Mark, uh, for the introduction. I think it was about a year and a half ago, right, that we started talking about the possibility of coming, and it's been uh, a little challenge to get it on the schedule. But it's great to be with you um, uh, this morning. Uh, and it's also very encouraging to me to see such an active group that advocates what you advocate here in the, in the greater Portland area. Uh, my wife and I and our older son, um, he said we have two children. Our older son is 40. Our younger son is 37. So um, we're in that stage of life. And, uh, but our older son, his wife, and all the grandchildren, to include the one on the way, are here with us as well uh, up in the uh, Vancouver area. We moved here from uh, Houston, Texas uh, a little over two years ago, uh, and we love it here. We love uh, everything about it. And uh, incidentally, as an aside, you may find this interesting and it may come out in the Q&A. We came here because of not only my work at NASA, um, but focused on the International Space Station, uh, I've been to Russia many, many, many times and spent lots of time in Russia and got involved in the evangelical community in the Moscow area. Well, it turns out, just up here in little battleground Washington, uh, is sort of strategic ground center uh, for faithful Russian preaching in a small church up there that we joined the ministry of that has a worldwide reach uh, reaching about 2 million listens, if you will, on the internet a month. Um, and six-day creationist, uh, Bible-centric, focused on Christ with an, with an impact around the world to Russian speakers. Uh, so part of the theme that I want to communicate with you is not only the focus on creation and, and the things that I'm going to talk and I, what I want to do is I want to take you to the vantage point of orbit and let you experience a, a little bit of a taste of what I was enable, able to experience um, and was uh, given the, the opportunity, if you will, to consider these truths of God's creative work uh, from that vantage point of, of orbit, which you see here on the screen. Um, but also, some other themes kind of woven into that to include the, the outworking of God's providence in our lives. Um, so even the bigger picture, bigger than creation, bigger than, than the details of what we're talking about is, is that, the, um, the, the working in the context uh, and being able to apply a biblical worldview to that context to include the geopolitics of things. And you can imagine the irony of all of that now, even today, with the war going on. Um, and I'm, by the way, I'm still working for NASA um, and still actively involved in the space station, not flying anymore. I tell people, Anna Marie won't let me go again. 
Um, you might even be able to imagine the sacrifice that she went through, and personal sacrifice over those many years of me being away in Russia training uh, or elsewhere training. And then, of course, as she likes to say, off the planet um, <laughs> those uh, several times. I want to read to you uh, in the beginning here uh, one of my favorite passages, and of course, like I'm sure it's true with you, I have many favorite passages, but in this context, I want to start off by kind of setting our minds to what the psalmist says in Psalm 111. Uh, a few minutes ago, they mentioned my book. Uh, on the back cover of the book is Psalm 111. There's a reason for that, and after this talk, I think you'll you understand why. It's a fairly short psalm, um, but I love it, and I'll talk about it more through the talk. I'll touch on it. But the psalmist writes, Praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart in the company of the upright in the congregation. Great are the works of the Lord, studied by all who delight in them. Full of splendor and majesty is His work, and His righteousness endures forever. He has caused His wonder, wondrous works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and merciful. He provides food for those who fear Him. He remembers His covenant forever. He has shown His people the power of His works in giving them the inheritance of the nations. The works of His hands are faithful and just. All His precepts are trustworthy. They are established forever and ever to be performed with faithfulness and uprightness. He sent redemption to His people. He has commanded His covenant forever. Holy and awesome is His name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All those who practice it have a good understanding. His praise endures forever. I want to go back and give a central focus on verse 2. We'll touch on the rest of the psalm through the talk, but verse 2 specifically, um, and you'll understand why as we go through this talk. Verse 2 says, great are the works of the Lord. And of course, in this context, I know you think of the works of the Lord to include what? Creation, right? Uh, but the works of the Lord also include provision. And He provisions us in many ways. They include providence, which I already touched on. And we can only understand all of those works of the Lord through the lens of His work of redemption in Christ who I know this crowd knows is also the creator of all things and who sustains his creation. Verse 2, great are the works of the Lord, studied by all who delight in them. And I know this crowd can relate to that as well. There's specifically two words, studied and delight. Notice that it's not a command for us to study his works. It's not a command for us to delight in his works. It's in the indicative case. It's a statement of facts. Those who are of the Lord study His works. And you do that. And oh, by the way, they're believers who study the works of the Lord. That's what we do in life. That's how we get to know the worker. Uh, but also the word delight. It's not com commanding us again to delight in the works. It's saying we are not only believers, but we are believers delighting in His works. Um, so we need to keep that in mind. Uh, it's, it's a great reminder. We're, we, they are studied works, and we are delighting believers. And that's what I want to do uh, today is, is maybe take you to this vantage point from, uh, from a unique perspective. And I understand we'll take a break in, 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 uh, in the middle of the talk, so we'll finish the talk after the break, and then there'll be opportunity for, for Q&A. This vantage point, by the way, we're all, if you look at the picture, we're 250 miles up is all. Uh, so we're relatively close. It's an it's a amazing vantage point uh, to study the earth specifically. But just to orient you, um, this crowd... You might recognize this as what? The Columbia River. I'm hearing the mumbling out there. This is the Columbia River. I took this series of pictures very rapidly flying over the Pacific Ocean as we approached the West Coast. 
specifically the coast here in Oregon. And I was able to snap off these pictures in a, the, my last flight, which was in 2016. And then I merged all these pictures together. So that's why it's that jagged um, uh, shape that you see. But it's, you can very easily see the mouth of the Columbia, of course, where Astoria is just on the, on the south side of the river, and then up the winding uh, area to see Vancouver, and uh, the, at least part of Portland up there in the, um, in the valley in which we, we sit right now. And just to zoom in on the Vancouver, Portland area, that's what it looks like. So I, I was actually already working with the church up in Battleground during this flight, so I took this and sent it to them, and, and then took a picture directly overhead of the church, and during, on a Sunday morning and, and sent it on email uh, to the pastor during the first service. And I said, it's good to see everybody assembled to worship the Lord. <laughs> um, and he, he got the email, and between services, he was able to then download it and, um, and show it to the second service, which was, was a lot of fun. Now, so I've introduced the themes, the themes that you are all very familiar with, the th themes that you would expect from one of the speakers that you invite to one of these forums. Now I want to introduce something else, and then we're going to ask the questions, how can these two things exist side by side? And it's the things we would, might say, the things that normally go on in the world around us. Uh, this is the space shuttle. Unfortunately, they're all in museums or on display now. We're not flying it anymore. But it was the primary means and its primary purpose way back in the 1970s was to put up an international space station. Anybody here see a shuttle launch during the years it flew uh, in person? I don't see a hand. Uh, it's a little dark for me out there, but I don't see a hand. It was an amazing event to go witness. The closest you could get was three miles away. It produces or produced on liftoff seven and a half million pounds of thrust from two solid rocket boosters and three main engines. And it was lifting four million pounds of weight off the launch pad. Um, so tremendous power. And even though you were three miles away at the closest to watch this thing, once the sound hit you, first you saw the smoke, you saw this, you saw the fire, you saw the, the smoke. And then 15 seconds or so later when the sound hit you, it just shook your whole body. Your chest just vibrated uh, from the, the roar of the liftoff. And if we can turn the audio up, you can get a little bit of an experience of that. And maybe the audio is not going to work today. When that thing lifted off, you knew something significant just happened in your life, right? <laughs> something that you've been preparing for, you've been thinking about and, and whatnot. Unfortunately, we don't have the audio, but you get the idea um, this, it took, there's, uh, after two minutes, the solid rocket booster separated and then the three main engines continued to carry uh, it to orbit. We were a crew of seven and uh, carrying about 40,000 pounds in the payload bay. And in less than nine minutes, you got to orbit. You, so in nine minutes, you were seeing this going up the, off the east coast from Florida, uh, heading toward Newfoundland. Um, and then across the Atlantic Ocean to Europe. And in that less than nine minutes, you were going 17,500 miles an hour. That's orbital velocity. That's around the Earth every 90 minutes. So 16 times a day, you orbited the Earth. Um, and I'll come back to that a little bit later. Um, the primary purpose of the space shuttle was to put up the International Space Station. And my four flights spanned the building, the construction of the International Space Station. First one was in 2000, when it was just two modules. It was very small. And then in 2006, I went back for a six-month stay. We were halfway through building it. Um, I was on a crew of two. I had my Russian crewmate, Pavel Vinogradov, and me. We were all by ourselves. We had arrived on a Soyuz uh, spacecraft launching from Kazakhstan. Um, the space shuttle was grounded at the time. It was shortly after the Columbia accident when we lost that crew in, in the Columbia uh, over Texas and Louisiana. You might remember it broke up on entry due to a failure in the thermal control system. So we had suspended the assembly of the space station. So basically we were there keeping the station alive uh, for that two and a half years or so 
uh, of recovering from the, the shuttle tragedy and getting it flying it again. Uh, and we did. During our stay, Pavel and I, three months into our stay, uh, we started flying the space shuttle, so we received uh, uh, the first shuttle flight, uh, first successful shuttle flight after that with, where the problems were worked out. And then at the end of our stay, uh, we resumed assembly with the, uh, with the addition of another truss segment. Each of the segments of the space station were about 40 feet long and, say, 12 feet in diameter, to give you an idea. And it was basically like, uh, like a, a Lego set or an erector set, piece by piece, starting in 1998 and finishing up in 2011, uh, we put it up piece by piece. Um, so halfway through in 2006, I was there, and then I went back in 2009 in the fall through the spring of 10 for another six-month stay. During that time, we finished it, and it, it looked in 2010 much like what you see in the picture here. In the picture, the space station, is, if you could lay it on the ground, it's bigger than a football field. So just to give you an idea of, of scope, of measure. If you could weigh it, if you could put it on a scale and weigh it, it's just shy of a million pounds. Inside the habitable volume, the pressurized part, which is up the center of this, of this picture, the modules that you see going up the center part longitudinally in our, from our viewpoint, it's uh, the volume of a 5,000 square foot house. Uh, we have a crew of seven on board right now. Um, I've been, so in 2010, we finished the assembly, and then I went back for the final time in 2016. It's in full operational mode. Um, we're rotating crews four times a year, part of the crew four times a year, on either a Russian Soyuz or now a, a SpaceX a Dragon vehicle. Um, and in that time, I was there with the crew size not only of two, but three and five and six. Um, so as we grew the crew size over that time, so that kind of gives you the scope of my experience on the space station. Um, my personal goal with the time up there was to steward the opportunity to take photography, mostly photography, some video, to be able to then bring it back and share the experience vicariously with you. And that's what I'm attempting to do today. I want to vicariously take you to that vantage point and consider what we can see from that vantage point, which parallels the vantage point we have right here in life by the way, to see the works of, of the Lord, uh, to consider how we, they are studied works, how we study them, and how we delight in them. I said we travel around the earth in 90 minutes. If you can imagine the sphere of the earth and the equator, we're inclined at the equator 53.6 degrees, 51.6 degrees. What that means is we cross the equator, go up to 51.6 north latitude, come back across the equator, go down to 51.6 uh, degrees south latitude, cross the equator again. And in one orbit, the Earth is rotated. It's once every 24 hours, right? So it has moved. Uh, so we're crossing the equator about 1,500 miles to the west of the previous crossing. So if you imagine that, imagine the globe, imagine what we see, then we see the entire Earth over time in different lighting conditions, day and night, over the weeks and months that you're on board, except for the North and South Pole. So again, it's an incredible vantage point. Again, we're about 250 miles up. Just to give you a perspective out the window, here's a nighttime view out the window. Um, you can see the Earth on the, on the bottom there with mostly cloud covered and blurred, and you see the lights on the surface of the Earth. Those are city lights. And it's blurred because this is a, obviously a time exposure uh, to get the stars to show up. The yellow or gold arc there is the lower part of the atmosphere. Um, and it has a glow to it uh, that is largely due to the sun on the other side of the earth shining through it. And then, of course, the, the amazing star field. And all the structure that you see there are components of the, the space station. Um, by the way, the, the wings on the side that you saw in that previous picture, you can see some of the dark wings pointing down and uh, over the earth. Those are solar arrays that we use to capture the sun's energy, produce electricity 
to charge batteries so the batteries can be discharged when we're on the night side of the earth um, and, uh, and charge the, the batteries uh, when we're illuminated by the sun to power all of the equipment on board. So daytime, illuminated by the sun, this is the vantage point out the window. This is what you see with the naked eye. Um, and I like to I include a couple of pictures in this presentation of spacewalks, uh, primarily for the kids that are here, because everybody finds it very interesting uh, to, um, to do this. And I would call it the highlight of the entire experience from, from a personal point of view. It's the hardest thing we do, both physically and mentally. Um, it's difficult to work in a, in a pressurized suit, and uh, you're outside for six and a half or seven hours. So it's a long day. It takes about six hours just to get in the suit, get down to uh, the lower pressure in 100% oxygen after having washed the nitrogen out of your bloodstream, preparing the tools, doing all the checks to make sure the suit is safe. And then when you finally go outside, out the door through the airlock, and there's two of you, um, you're outside for six and a half, seven hours. Um, but it's, it's, it's an amazing, it's the highlight of the entire experience. Imagine being outside, hanging on to the space station and looking at the entire globe of the earth. And I knew I didn't need to do it in this crowd, but sometimes in my talks I will answer two questions at the front end of the talk because I know there, there can be out there. The first one is, the answer to the first question I'll, I'll give is, yes, we did land on the moon. And the answer to the second question that I'll often offer at the beginning of a talk is, no, the earth is not flat. Um, I'm, I'm pretty confident I don't have that case in this crowd. Um, but, I mean, to, to hang on to the space station, like you see here, and look down, and not only see the work that, that NASA and the partners, the international partners, have done to design this thing and put it up, um, and all its capability, which is still going, by the way, we've had over 22 years of human presence in space, continuous, over 22 years, and a lot of the public doesn't know that. But now you're, you're hanging on to this thing, considering all of that, and, but then looking down at the globe of the Earth, traveling around it multiple times in a spacewalk. Um, I like showing this picture to young people, too. This, we were doing selfies before the word was invented. <laughs> And what you see here is the visor on the helmet, of course, is covered with a gold plating to protect us from the sun's harmful rays, um, like a sunglasses, I guess you could say, but it's very reflective. So right there in the center of the picture, you see the objective lens of a Nikon camera wrapped in a thermal blanket, a white thermal blanket pointed uh, directly at the face, and then this, this amazing reflection uh, because of the, the convex shape of the visor, you get this distortion. But uh, you see the U.S. flag there in the, on the shoulder. Uh, you see the structure of the space station, and you see the globe of the Earth in the background. So again, just another perspective of the, w this amazing adventure uh, flying from this vantage point. One of the things that uh, you immediately think of, not unlike some of the scenery around here in our area, with the mountains and whatnot, is you think, wow, beautiful, right? Awe and wonder. It invokes awe and wonder. All of that is, I'm pretty confident you know, points to the Creator. It points to the ultimate source of beauty. He defines beauty. Uh, what we see in creation is reflected beauty um, in His creation. And this is an example of, of that. These are uh, looking uh, at the, an oblique angle of the edge of the earth, um, and in the upper part of the screen, you see the atmosphere. In the lower part, of course, you see the reflections of the sun off the, the water. This is an ocean somewhere. I forget exactly where it is. But then the different layers of, of clouds. And we think symmetry. We think beauty. We think harmony. We think delight. We think awe and wonder. Um, all of that does, reminds us of two things. It reminds us of the Creator and His qualities and His attributes. But it also reminds us, if, and we often don't think about this, of what it means to bear His image. 
we are assembled today. We care about these things. We find it interesting. We have the curiosity because we bear the image of God. And oh, by the way, uh, the ability to go to this vantage point and to do all those things that I rehearsed in, in my history is a reflection of the ability that God gave the creatures that bear His image. And I'll talk a little bit more in a little bit. It also is dependent upon the provisioning of His creative work. Um, and we, when we think of provision, we think of mining ore out of the ground, but it's so much more than that. We think of food, food sources, but it's so much more than that. And I'll get into that in, in a little bit later. Ninety minutes around the earth, in that orbit, every orbit, you see a sunrise or a sunset if you're looking out the window. And here's an example of the moment of a sunset uh, where you can see the, clearly the, the atmosphere and a little bit of the layers of the atmosphere where you see the orange color. That's down where the weather systems are, the lower part of the atmosphere. And where you see the blues and uh, yellows and, and whites is above the, the weather system. Here's a close-up of just after a sunset where you can see the, the, the layers of the atmosphere a little bit more uh, succinctly. And again, we think awe and wonder. We think beauty. We think harmony. It's pleasing to us. Um, it's pleasing to our sight in the same way that good music is pleasing to the ear. Um, and it's all reflections in different ways of the attributes of our Creator and Redeemer. Another example from our vantage point here is uh, just prior to a moonset, uh, uh, which is an amazing view. To, and you see a little bit of a distortion on the bottom of the moon, bottom of the moon here due to the, the refraction of the upper parts of the Earth's atmosphere. Here's uh, an example of some of the fascinating, unique things you can see from our vantage point. These are called noctilucent clouds. And I said earlier that we don't go over the north or south pole, but we do see at an oblique angle up near the poles. And this picture was taken uh, in the summer of 2016, looking over the north pole. We are on the dark side of the earth, but because it's summertime, it's lit at the North Pole all the time. Uh, this is the atmosphere over the North Pole. So the sun is behind the earth from our vantage point, but the atmosphere is illuminated from behind. These noctilucent clouds are not fully understood. Um, they're higher. They're about 80 kilometers and up in altitude. Uh, so they're much higher than any aircraft fly. Uh, the theory is, is that they're made up of ice crystals that somehow get carried up to the upper parts of the atmosphere and through the, the variety of, of the jet stream and, and air currents, both vertical and horizontal, you get this very unique pattern of layers with repeating patterns in, in each layer. This is a great example of order. And some of you might have a background in mathematics or engineering. And so you understand order. You understand order in physics you understand order maybe in chemistry. Uh, you understand order in all of the sciences. That's very important for us to comprehend and to understand when we consider the provision of God. Uh, things are very predictable because of the precise mathematical order that God has put in his creative work. And oh, by the way, bearing his image, we're given the ability to go discover that order. Man did not invent mathematics. Mathematics, the mathematical order has been discovered. It was there all along in his creative work. And here's a, um, a visual example of that, that order, repeating patterns. Uh, here's another example of um, just awe and wonder of, of the view. This is obviously the aurora. Uh, and I believe this is over the north. You also see it over the south. But an incredible uh, beauty that also points to a lot of the order of God's creative work. When we consider the atmosphere, when we consider the sun's rays, when we consider the magnetic field of the earth, which I, I 
presume many of you have been exposed to in one way or another, to one degree or another. Um, this is what it produces. Uh, and science can go study this, and it can, it can dissect and understand and discover the order that's there in so many different ways, all, again, pointing to God's provision in uh, his creative work. Another example of beautiful, this is back wide angle. In the foreground here, just to orient you, is the island of Cuba. Uh, in the upper part of the screen, coming down from the horizon, is the peninsula of Florida. Uh, and off to the right are the coral reefs of the Bahamas. And you think, beautiful. Again, it's the same kind of reaction that we get. And coral reefs became one of uh, the, the subjects that I tried to get a collection of around the world. This is a close up, closer view of the Bahamas, uh, which from our vantage point are the most beautiful coral reefs in the world. And the, the most vivid, beautiful coral reef, here's a close up of right here. Again, I took multiple shots and then stitched them together to get this overlap. But uh, just incredible beauty, incredible order of its own, symmetry, pleasing to the eye and color and harmony. All of that, again, demonstrates order, and it demonstrates what it means to bear the image of, of God. Another example, uh, this is a river delta on, on the island of Madagascar. Um, very unique, probably the most photographed river delta in the world uh, by astronauts because it stands out with the naked eye uh, because of its pattern, uh, unique pattern, but also its unique uh, color. Uh, made apparently and obviously from the, the soil uh, that comes down from upstream. Another uh, subject or a category that I have a big collection are glaciers. Uh, this glacier is in northern Pakistan. Um, just beautiful, again, in its pattern, symmetry, uh, et cetera. Or this glacier in the Patagonia region of uh, South America. Uh, and in my view the most beautiful glaciers in the world from our vantage point are in Patagonia. Uh, here's one example, and here's another example not too far away. Uh, another category uh, of um, subject, I guess, would be sand dunes, uh, which I took from all over the world as well. This one is in the Sahara Desert. Again, I use these as a, as a demonstration of the mathematical ordering of God's provision work. By the way, going back to the rocket launch, we launch, you know, we got the space station orbiting the Earth, as I said, 51.6 degrees inclination to the equator. So it's in an inertial orbit. The Earth is rotating under it once a day. Uh, the launch pad that you're going to launch a rocket from is, is passing under the orbit twice a day, really, right? But, but once a day going to the northeast. So how do you enter the orbit? Well, you have to launch at the right time. You have to launch when the launch pad is passing underneath the, the orbit. And then you have to point it in a certain direction. You have to get out of the atmosphere, and then you go parallel to the Earth's surface to basically enter into that orbit, but you enter into the orbit below the space station so that then you can go faster around the Earth and the space station to catch up to it, but then you have to elevate the orbit to get up to, to once you catch up to the space station, to stay there, to not fly past it. Um, and in the early days, we would take about, say, figure two days, a little less, 46 hours or so, from launch to docking, and you did some adjustments in the orbit along the way to, to catch up, but then to, to increase your altitude, to actually rendezvous with the space station. And we're both going 17,500 miles an hour, roughly, with some... Um, and then we, we get into proximity of the space station, and we need to capture its exact orbit so we don't go back down or, or, or past it or whatever. Uh, and then we finally get where we're just, uh, say, 100, 200 meters away apart, flying in parallel, flying in formation, and then we slowly approach the docking port at 0.1 feet per second, plus or minus an inch. 
How can we do that? We only can do that because of the order, the provision of order that God put in His creative work, the mathematical order and our ability to discover that mathematical order, come up with the, the theories of orbital mechanics, come up with the mathematical equations, do the calculations, put the right fuel on board, uh, fire it off at just the right time, and then do all of those adjustments to orbit to do all that. I believe, I've come to the conclusion that the precision in God's creative work is infinitely precise. Infinitely precise. When we look at things, a lot of times we see chaos, we see noise, but inside of that, I believe there's infinite precision. You can go all the way down to the atomic level and think of protons, neutrons, electrons, which we don't really see like we would normally see bigger objects, but we understand them, and it's a demonstration of order. And my contention is, is that God's precision is infinite, infinitely precise. We're only limited by our ability to measure it. Uh, and if you look at the history of technology, the history of civilization, the history of development, um, our technological progress, if you want to call it that, which can be used largely for good, but also can be used for evil, we know that, is dependent upon our ability to measure the precision that's present in God's ordered work, uh, given the ability that He's given us. Uh, and one great illustration in history that you can use to demonstrate that is the measurement of time. We don't even know what time is, really. Uh, but you can go back to leaving the coast of a continent in a ship where the continent became out of view. To know where you were in, in longitude required that you kept time. That was really hard to do in a, in, a, um, in a ship that moved around a lot until just prior to the age of discovery, Right? when clocks were invented that could keep time on a ship and you could use that to navigate your longitude. And shortly after that, North America was discovered. And you can go all the way down to present day where most of us have one of these in our pocket. Um, and this only works because all of the GPS satellites and all of the, the whole network around the world now is synchronized precisely with time. Um, so that's, that's the current end of that spectrum of measurement. The precision of time's always been there. It's, it's never not been there. But what has changed is our ability to measure it. I'll come back to this example here in a minute, but I better keep moving or we'll be here all day. Another example of sand dunes. Uh, this is in uh, Mongolia, and those are our lakes between the dunes. And I understand it's one of those... Uh, uh, popular in a very narrow sense because all of us don't typically travel to places like this, uh, but it's a, it's a tourist attraction to go, go to these places and, and see the dunes. Uh, or here's a, this is my favorite one of sand dunes to show that mathematical order because notice the geometric design here. You see orthogonal lines. You see repeating patterns in large scale and small scale. So it looks like somebody made this, right? But this is just uh, from prevailing winds, sand blown around over I don't know how much period of time. I don't know if this changes over, over a short period of time or not. But it clearly shows the mathematical order in God's creation, which again is a significant part of his provisioning of his creation and his sustaining of his creation as well, which I'll get to in a minute. Uh, some other varieties of, um, of uh, our, what we can see from our vantage point. You might recognize this. Many of you have been there, I'm sure. The Grand Canyon. This is what it looks like from the point of view on the south end of uh, Arizona, I think, looking a little bit uh, at a bleak angle to the north. Or closer to home here, Mount St. Helens, uh, which I took many, many uh, pictures of. Or speaking of volcanoes, I've got to pause and tell this story because my wife is here and I'll hear about it if I don't tell the story. <laughs> uh, this is an example of God's provision in life. 
in the providential care day by day. And I want to tell the story because we all receive the providential care of God day by day. We just need to see it. We need to acknowledge it. We need to grow in our acknowledgement of it uh, and grow in our gratitude for it. So here we are in this picture. It's in May of 2006. I'm six weeks into my first six-month stay, which at the time I thought was going to be my last six-month stay. Um, Pavel and I were on board, the two of us. It was, the mission was going fine, but six weeks... Uh, had been a long time, so I was missing Anna Marie. I knew she was missing me. Um, so I was just having one of those days, just kind of down a little bit. And uh, because the six months, the end wasn't in sight, right? It was over, it was over the horizon. Uh, and we, we talked every day while I was up there. I could call, uh, and I typically called when uh, she was, I knew she was awake in the morning because we were six hours ahead on Greenwich Mean Time. Uh, either I knew she was awake somehow or I thought she should be awake and I would call and wake her up. <laughs> um, but I went back uh, late morning uh, to have a bag of tea with Pavel. And you can't have a cup of tea. You have to have everything in a bag through a straw and weightlessness, of course. So, and it was our habit. We'd get together. He was working on the Russian part. I was working on the U.S. part. Uh, we'd get together, chat a little bit, take a break. And I got done with that, and I started floating back to my end of the station. And I passed over a window and saw that we were flying over the Aleutian Islands. And it was my habit to grab opportunities and take pictures. So I grabbed the camera, which was right there, started taking pictures, first of one island, then the next island, then the next island. Something in the back of my head said that last one didn't look right. I went back and reframed it, and it was this volcano erupting. And you can see that the eruption had just started because the entire plume is in view here. And, of course, I was all excited. I mean, this is something unique, something new. And uh, I, I was able to snap off two or three pictures uh, before it went out of view, and then I, I floated up quickly to the other end of the station called Houston, and they could hear the excitement of my voice. Hey, I just discovered a newly erupting volcano. Uh, I thought you'd like to know. I took some pictures. They're in the downlink folder, so come and get them. Um, and after our conversation, I went back to work and my assigned work. But I knew 90 minutes later we were going to pass over it again. So I was in the window, had set my alarm. Uh, 90 minutes later, here's the volcano. Not a puff coming out of it, just fresh lava flowing down the sides. In the meantime, in that 90 minutes, there was a, uh, another astronaut that was a Capcom in Mission Control by the name of Steve Bowen. He'd gotten on the Internet and uh, um, found the Alaskan Volcano Observatory. He called them up, said, hey, we just, this is Steve Bowen calling from Mission Control at NASA down in Houston. We just got a report from the space station that one of your volcanoes is erupting. We thought you'd like to know. <laughs> and uh, the scientist... The scientist on the other end of the phone, he, he told me later, he said, I could tell she, did not, she was not buying this story. Certainly this was a prank call. Uh, he tried to convince her that, no, this is on the up and up. Well, during that 90 minutes in the orbit, he got, her my, uh, got to me her name and phone number, so I called her up. <laughs> and in those days, you had a delay in the transmission from the space station so it was a very unique call. I said, hey, this is Jeff Williams on the space station. I heard you got the report. Have you got my pictures of your volcano yet? No. And she didn't know how to reply. And still, I could tell with the tone of her voice, she wasn't challenging me, but I could tell she wasn't completely buying into this. Anyway, we had a lot of fun with it afterwards, and I was able to interact with them after the flight. Uh, but the point was the the volcano was done. Um, to this day, this was in 2006, to this day I'm the only person I know of that saw that particular eruption. Um, it had to be very short, obviously. Um, in, in terms of God's provision, Anna Marie had been praying for me that day that the Lord would bring something into my day that would lift me out of my slump. <laughs> Never did we think it would be a volcano eruption. Um, <laughs> But that's what it was. We, we all have a duty to look for that, right? The Lord brings things into our life each and every day 
to sustain us, to encourage us, uh, things that we should be marveling at, things that we should be thankful for. Nothing happens by chance, not even creation, right? Nothing happens by chance. Um, and we need to grow in our gratitude for that. Another example of his provision, obviously, food sources, agriculture. Uh, this yellow is rapeseed, which, from which is made uh, canola oil. This is in Eastern Europe. It's, uh, I've found over the years from this vantage point that this is a, a growing industry because this was a new crop, at least to me, in that part of the world. It was, it, before that, I had seen it in Canada, but not in Europe. Or closer to home here, these are logging operations just up north of the Columbia River, not too far from Mount St. Helens. I presume they're square miles. It looks like a checkerboard laid over the, uh, the, the mountain areas around us. Talked about mines earlier. Lots of, lots of examples of that, of God's provision that come in mines. This is a fish farm uh, near Alexandria, Egypt. Uh, in the uh, Nile River Delta. Um, this shows up very uniquely in that I caught it just as the sun glint was passing over uh, these fish farms. And uh, after the flight, I did some research and found out they grow mostly tilapia here for the European market. Another example of God's provision and man's ability to extract from that provision, these are uh, salt ponds or evaporation ponds of some sort in western China so visible from, from our vantage point. Uh, you might recognize this as the Nile River Delta, uh, which of course, if, if, as we consider our themes today, we, it's a great example to see history of civilization, right? Uh, and also related to biblical history. Uh, if we uh, do a close-up here in the area, right there in the center of the picture are the pyramids. Uh, and you can see the contrast between the desert next to the Cairo region, which is very irrigated. Uh, but those are the pyramids. We see um, a, an example of ancient history here that's very obvious to us, very visible. You can go visit this place. At the other end of the spectrum, um, in terms of history of humanity, modern day, this is New York City, uh, maybe the, the center of the financial world if you will, the world center for lots of things in terms of commerce and finances and whatnot. And if you consider it from our vantage point, the provisioning of God's work um, and His creative work and His work of provision in some of the areas that I've given illustrations to and then our ability to extract from that provision, this would be one result of that in our modern day. It's a, why is this important? It's important to get a to have a Christian biblical worldview of all things, right? We our faith is not separated from what we would call secular parts of the world. We need to grow in this not only in our convictions that Genesis one through eleven is true, uh, but to take all of the Bible to include Genesis one and eleven and apply it to an understanding that gives us a biblical worldview of all things to include, you know, in this case, economics and world commerce and whatnot. We can only understand all of these things through the lens of Scripture as one redeemed, given the gift of faith, whose eyes are open um, by, through the redemptive work of Jesus Christ and the gift of grace uh, by the power of the Spirit and the Word of God, the special revelation of the Word of God, and that's what we see in this vantage point. So every day we would pass over this part of the earth, of course, and you can understand why it has significant meaning. Here in this view, you can see the entire life of Christ geographically, right? Even at childhood going to Egypt uh, to flee the threat of, of murder. Um, and then so right here in the center, you see the Dead Sea. You can see the Jordan River Valley um, and, uh, and the Sea of Galilee. I think I want to come back to that, and I'm going to come back and try to tie all these things together, but I was instructed in our program, this is about the time to take a break. Um, so if you want to talk about the schedule for the break, and then I'm going to come back, and I want to try to get more biblical in the themes and tie this together and then transition to Q&A. Does that sound good? Yes, sound 
this is amazing. It is a blessing this morning. Thank you. Thank you. I'm not exactly sure. I could go in many directions now in this little segment, but, uh, but I'll get started and we'll see where we end up. Um, what I want to try to do is kind of tie some of these themes together that I've introduced you to uh, through um, the earlier part of the talk. I want to read a quote. Uh, like I said earlier, I spent a lot of time in Russia. From the late 1990s, uh, the most recent trip was just prior to the COVID shutdown. Uh, probably had 60 trips, six zero trips over there over those years. In the early 2000s, I was spending half my time there. I remember coming back to JFK from Moscow on Delta Flight 31 one time, and I had a backpack, and that was it. And I was going through customs, and the customs agent says to me, how long have you been in Russia? Um, five weeks. You got check bags? No. You were in Russia for five weeks, and all you have is a backpack? I said, it's a second home. I leave my stuff there. Um, I lived and worked in a place called Star City, or Zvozny Gorodok in Russian. And I know there's at least one Russian speaker here. Um, it's named after uh, Yuri Gagarin, who was the first man in space. And on weekends, I would often go into Moscow just to roam around. And you can imagine the irony of being an active duty army officer, army colonel, running around Moscow free with a camera. I would often take a big camera and just go exploring uh, and taking pictures and, and doing all of that. Well, I would often take the regional train into Moscow, which was an adventure in itself. In those days, there were gangs on the trains, and you had to really be careful. I never, never would be on a train in the dark by myself, always with a group. For that reason, we had some assaults over the years that, uh, from our, our team. And, uh, but I would take this train in, and the platform outside of Star City was called the Tsiolkovsky platform. And it was named after a guy by the name of Konstantin Tsiolkovsky. And I found this quote from him. He, was, uh, he worked in, he's considered the father of the Russian space program, Soviet space program. He wrote, from the rocket, we shall see the huge sphere of the planet Earth, like phases of the moon. We shall see how the sphere rotates and how within a few hours it shows all its sides su successively. And we shall observe various points on the surface of the Earth for several minutes and from different sides very closely. This picture is so majestic, attractive, and infinitely varied that I wish with all my soul that you and I could see it. Well, I just gave you a glimpse of that, what he hoped for. He wrote that in 1911. Wow. 1911. Baron, now I don't have any evidence to suggest that he was a believer, but he certainly gives evidence of bearing the image of the Creator right, with some of the attributes that I've introduced you to in the earlier part of the talk. He was a physicist, so he knew the order. He had discovered the mathematical order. He knew theoretically what could be done. He knew theoretically that you could develop a rocket, which hadn't been developed yet, and you could launch it, and you could launch it in a way and at a speed, and he, he, theor he theorized how you could get the power, the propulsion to do so, and then get in orbit around the earth and experience all of the things that many of us have experienced, in which you experienced vicariously through this, this uh, uh, talk. I mean, that is amazing to me, and it's an illustration of what I'm talking about. We've been given an amazing ability as co-regents of God to care for his creation. Now, one of the themes I want to touch on now is, was in Psalm 111. Great are the works of the Lord, studied by all who delight in them. That speaks directly to that. 
It speaks to scientific endeavor. Uh, and you say, well, it was a believer that wrote that. And I, would, I would agree with you. That's a believer's perspective. Did you know, uh, you, you're familiar with the history of the age of science, what we call the age of science? You know names like um, Kepler, who did a lot of work in, in the theoretical orbital dynamics, um, came up with the theories that uh, mathematically illustrated the orbits of the planets. Isaac Newton then came along a little bit later, <clears throat> and we know Newton's laws of motion. We use them every day. You use F equals MA every time you get into your car. Uh, you use it every time you trip and fall and <laughs> experience the, the force of gravity, both in the fall and in the impact on uh, whatever you're hitting. So that's Isaac Newton. So he took what Kepler did and he even, you know, took it farther. You've got other scientists, great scientists like Boyle, um, Boyle's laws. A lot of these guys have laws named after them or equations named after them. Faraday, um, many, many others. Did you know that they were all theologians first? Uh, some of you, I'm sure, did. Uh, but that's true. They were driven by their theology. And Psalm 111 was considered the scientist psalm. You've heard the word calling, and the synonym would be vocation. Uh, with a lot of audiences, when I talk about vocation, and people, people immediately think, okay, going to become a machinist or an electrician, you know, learning a vocation. And certainly that's a, a meaning of the word. But vocation has a broader meaning. It means calling. It's from the Latin, as I recall, and calling. As believers, we see all of life as a calling. We should. I alluded to it earlier. We don't separate the sacred from the secular. All of life is sacred for a believer. Uh, I've talked about worldview and different aspects of worldview not only in the doctrine of creation, but in all doctrines of the Bible, but also everything else in the world, to include the stewardship of the planet or whatnot, as, as uh, you know, if you go back to the dominion mandate of Genesis 1. Uh, we all have callings in life. I loved what Luther expanded on and others have expanded on in the concept of calling. He talked about the calling of the milkmaid, right? Even uh, the, the, the milkmaid drawing milk for daily provision to feed the family. Um, whatever work we do is part of our calling. We should see it that way. If we're called to be a plumber, electrician, an astronaut, a doctor, uh, we should see it as serving the Lord in that calling. If we're called to be a husband, or a wife. We should see it as a calling. Uh, if we're a child who have parents, to serve our parents and fulfill the obligations of a child is, the, is we're reminded of in the Ten Commandments. We should see it as a calling. We should have a growing understanding of callings in life. I like to think of them as different offices of life with duties and obligations inherent in that office. And we all, in that sense, bear offices in life, multiple offices. That's how we should approach things every day. Well, these scientists in the age of science certainly did that. They saw that they were gifted, they had developed interests, they had developed abilities in math and science, and they understood that God in His creative work not only created, but he provisioned his creation and he sustains his creation with his ongoing power. And in that provision is the opportunity to develop, to discover the order, to discover the provisioning, and then develop it. Um, uh, before I go back to the age of science, I, I just remembered um, I want to go to Job chapter 28. Job chapter 28, considered the oldest book of the Bible, right? 
So we don't know exactly when it was written, but we think it was written even before Moses wrote the, the Pentateuch. Job 28 is a, an amazing chapter. It's sort of an interlude in this book that we would consider, first and foremost, a book about suffering and the, the questions that surround suffering. And, and that is a major theme. We know the, the story of Job. But I think there's a bigger theme in Job. The bigger theme of Job is God himself, that he is incomprehensible, that he is completely beyond, that's the definition of infinite, right? We are finite. He is completely beyond us, completely beyond our understanding. He is sovereign over all things. He is infinite in all his ways. He is holy. We are not. We can't, he is incomprehensible, ultimately, uh, except to the degree that he has revealed himself to us. But yet, back in that previous theme, he has provisioned his earth. He had give, has given us the mandate in Genesis 1 to subdue it. Uh, and he's given us the ability to do so. And the first half of Job 28 speaks to that. Uh, and I'm not going to read the whole thing, but it, uh, I'll, I'll just kind of skip through it. In Job 28, it says, starts out, Surely there is a mine for silver and a place for gold that they refine. Iron is taken out of the earth, and copper is smelted from the ore. So he's talking about the provision in God's creation and man's ability to extract that provision, to go find it, to discover it. Think about it. Just to, to see something and say, hmm, what can I do with this? Well, let me try some things. Let me apply some heat to it and see what happens. Uh, and oh, by the way, this new product that I have, what can I do with it? Well, I can do something even more with it. Well, what about, we got this here. What about this over there? What, what happens if I combine the two? And you, so you can see the thread, right, that of progression of the subduing of God's provision that he has granted to us in his creation. Um, and man can do amazing things. In verse 4, it talks about opening a shaft in a valley away from where anyone lives. And then it's got this theme of being deep down into a, into a shaft hanging on a rope to get down there to do the work and perhaps to get up, I hope to get up, uh, where he says, man opens shafts in the valley and they're forgotten by travelers. In other words, there's a lot of other things go going on around us that are oblivious to the work, this technological work, this discovery, this exploration, this mining here. They hang in the air far away from mankind. They swing to and fro. So again, this image of being deep down in a mine shaft. Out of the earth comes bread. Uh, underneath it is turned up as by fire. Its stones are a place of sapphires. It has dust of gold. So again, talking about the provision and man's ability to find it. And then it says, no bird of prey knows. No falcon's eye has seen it. Uh, the proud beast have not trodden it. The lion has passed over it. In other words, talking about the rest of the, 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 the life, if you will, that, that mankind is unique, bearing his image, but the animals float around. They don't, they don't care. They don't know. In my book, I talk about your dog, your pet dog. Your pet dog doesn't look up at the stars. We do. Um, so animals don't, they, they're just oblivious to it all. Man puts his hand to the flinty rock and overturns mountains by the roots. He cuts out channels in the rocks, and his eye sees every precious thing. He dams up the streams so that they do not trickle. We've got lots of dams around us here, right? Um, just think about the, the technology advancement and all of that. Now expand it to, to the things of rocketry, docking with space stations, building space stations. Back to this, the smartphone. I mean, think about this. What is the basic element of this, if you think about it? The basic element. Sand. Sand. Why do they call it Silicon Valley, right? Because computer chips' primary element is silica, which is the, the, the basic element of sand. So mankind has taken sand. They started with sand and produced this. And we have access, instant, almost instant access to information 
of, on almost any topic from almost anywhere in the world. And we can communicate most places in the world instantaneously. And I do it every day. Some of you do it as well. Uh, that's a testimony to God's provision, which, by the way, includes the order, the mathematical order, the physics, the chemistry, the optics, the electromagnetic um, arena. All of those things are examples of the order and our ability to discover it and to exploit it, to use it, to develop it, whatnot. Again, not invented by man, discovered by man. Uh, that's important for us uh, to understand. That's what drove the scientists. And they had uh, three presuppositions. They presupposed in the age of science, these guys that were theologians first and driven by their understanding of theology and in their calling of science, they were driven in their science because of their theology. They had three, three presuppositions. One was there was a rationality in creation. It was rational. It was, it was completed by an intelligence by God who has revealed himself, Romans 1, as he has revealed himself even in his creative work. A world must be lawfully ordered. You just need to discover the laws. The second presupposition was that there was a precision in that ordering, and I've talked about that enough. I don't need to say any more other than to remind you of my supposition that it's the precision is infinitely precise. We're just limited by our ability to measure it. They presupposed a precision in the order of creation. That's why it's called universe, right? Uh, because it's the whole is one. It's one magnificent transcendent ordering of God's work. There's a coherent whole. Uh, matter, energy, space, and time is considered precisely ordered. The third presupposition, and this one's a little bit harder to understand, but they, it, you can call it this, the contingency of nature. In other words, we can't look at nature and the, the, the laws don't jump out at us. They're not written on the surface of, of nature. Um, they're not intrinsic to nature is another way to say that but they're imposed by God. And reason only, reason only, just looking at nature and observing it, was insufficient to understand the orderly logic of the universe to the laws of nature. They had to be discovered, and that discovery required observation, experimentation, trial and error, measurement. Um, Nature does not have its own inherent rationality, but it is intelligible through discovery because it reflects God's rationality. And science, the effort of science was a way to understand that order. That was the path. So that was their understanding. Uh, before I run out of time, I, I, I want to touch on one other question that comes up. But before I do, I, I, I want to give this illustration. There's a Maxwell. Anybody of you that have science background, you heard of Maxwell's equations, right? The electromagnetics and primarily. James Clerk Maxwell, he was one of those in the age of science. He believed these presuppositions that I just reviewed. At age 40, uh, he was elected to a professorship at Cambridge. He designed and supervised the construction of the, what was called the Cavendish Laboratory and carved in the, heaven, the, the, the heavy wooden doors in the entrance of this new Cavador, uh, uh, laboratory was Psalm 111, verse 2, written in Latin, Great are the works of the Lord, studied by all who delight in them. Uh, that illustration really kind of focused me years ago uh, to spend some time in Psalm 111 to understand not only the psalm, but its place in, in history uh, on this topic. He was a man of deep Christian faith. He was even an elder in his church for a time. After his death, a written prayer was found among his papers. And it was this is what was written. His prayer, Maxwell's prayer. Almighty God, who created man in thine own image and made him a living soul that he might seek after thee, 
and have dominion over thy creatures. Teach us to study the works of thy hands, that we may subdue the earth to our use and strengthen the reason for thy service, and so to receive thy blessed word, that we may believe on him who thou hast sent to give us the knowledge of salvation and the remission of sins, all of which we ask in the name of the same Jesus Christ, our Lord. What a powerful prayer. And you can see what drove him in his work. And it's a great example for us. That should drive us in life, in whatever vocations the Lord has given us. Now, the obvious question is, if modern science, as we know it, was driven by these convictions, why is it so different today? And uh, typically, what comes to mind for most of us right away is, well, evolution, Charles Darwin. And that did have a big factor into it, but it was even broader than that. Um, some of you have heard the name of, uh, of Char uh, Thomas Huxley, right, who was an atheist and uh, uh, very active in trying to push the Christian faith out of the public square. Uh, very active. He was one of the, he was, in fact, he was called Darwin's bulldog. And his goal was to overthrow the cultural dominance of Christianity. By the way, I find it fascinating that a lot of this came out of the Cambridge Oxford community there near London. Both the age of science, most of those guys were there. But then later, these, they were influenced by, um, by these atheistic late 19th century, early 20th century, people that came largely from the same source, if you will, same location. The origin of the species certainly had a, a big impact, and we're, that's obvious to all of us. Um, but I, I've discovered in recent years there's also two other guys that had significant impact on the public view of the incompatibility or the conflict between science and faith or science and Christianity. There's a guy by the name of John William Draper, and he wrote a book. It was published in 1874 with the title, A History of the Conflict Between Religion and Science. And it did pretty well uh, in the public eye. It uh, presented the history of science as a narrative for all time as a progressive, uh, as a conflict between the progressive power of science and we hear that word progressive associated with progress in science, and the, listen to these words, regressive and repressive power of religion. Have you ever heard that as a critique of the Christian faith? Uh, that was Draper. He had an, uh, another guy who was uh, quite a bit different in personality and background, but had the, kind of the same agenda. He, uh, his name was Andrew Dixon White, and you can look these up. Just search for the conflict thesis, and actually Wikipedia has a pretty, pretty good introductory article on the topic, the conflict thesis. Andrew Dixon White was the founding president of Cornell University. And uh, Cornell was declared in its founding to be an asylum for science, where truth shall be sought for truth's sake, not stretched or cut exactly to fit revealed religion. So it was, you could say, maybe argue it was one of the early atheistic universities in our country. Uh, we think of the other universities that were started by the church, you know, the, the um, Harvard, Yale, and others, and then quickly abandoned the faith. But this one was founded with that agenda. White published a book, and it was a much bigger book, and it was published a little bit later, 1990, or 1896, it was called A History of the Warfare of Science with Theology and Christendom. In it, he juxtaposed the light of historical truth that was science with that decaying mass of outworn thought which attaches the modern world to medieval conceptions of Christianity, a menace to the whole normal evolution of society. It was 800 pages long. So these two works by Draper and White were popular received by a wide, a broad uh, population. 
and they were works of history. And they chronicled the, the long-standing conflict between science and specifically the Christian faith. In the academic world of historians, specifically those historians that focused on science, they were quickly dismissed as fabricated history. It was made up. Uh, but Huxley and others had, had energized the effort, and it was, in my view now, as I've uh, studied this, it is perhaps one of the most significant, prop successful propaganda campaigns in modern history. Because although the academic world dismissed it as fabricated and erroneous history, in the popular mind it exists to this day that there's a conflict, that religion is regressive, that science is progressive, that in, in the, I mentioned the word medieval, that the medieval times were the dark ages, which is also a label that's fabricated. Uh, this needs to be more taught and transmitted, this little piece of history, that science exists as we know it because of the Christian faith, uh, not uh, in conflict to it. I, I definitely wanted to leave that with you. Uh, back to Job 28. And let me see how am I doing on time here. I'm okay, I think. Back to Job 28. <clears throat> Again, the first half of the chapter focuses on the two things. God's provisioning of creation, um, which includes all of the things that we talked about. By the way, I, I am going to pause for, and inject something else here. Um, Hebrews 1 talks about Christ as the creator who created all things and upholds his creation, right? Um, the upholding of creation. And by the way, Colossians 1 also talks about the sustaining of his creation, that Christ created is the creator and the sustainer of all creation. That word specifically in Hebrews 1, upholds, has the idea of holding it up and moving forward toward a purpose, toward a goal, uh, toward a, we would say, a culmination. Um, the sustaining and the upholding of creation is something that we can't comprehend. But science suggest some ways that occurs. We would say theologically that we would cease to exist. The world, the universe, all of creation would cease to exist apart from God's active, ongoing, sustaining power, right? If we understand those verses, that's what we would conclude. It's not that he just created it, wound it up like a clock, like a deist would say, and then let it go about its business. Uh, he is actively sustaining, upholding his creation and Hebrews 1 suggests it's for an ultimate purpose, the culmination of all things. Um, science has four forces. The two of them are very well known, I think, uh, to you. Two of them may be lesser known. That science observes, and again, it's contingent. So science has discovered it through observation, through experimentation, through trial and error. One of them is very obvious, gravity. And um, Einstein and others have done a lot of work on gravity. We can describe it mathematically. It has a significant impact not only in our life practically, but that's why the moon rotates around the earth. That's why the earth rotates around the sun. That's why the space station rotates in a predictable way around, around the earth. Nobody really understands gravity. Nobody can explain it. Another force, fundamental force of nature, is electromagnetic force. We see it. It's very obvious to it. It's used all the time, practically, in every electric motor and other places. Your compass pointing to north. It's electromagnetic forces are well understood. They can be described mathematically. They can be applied because of the precision there. But nobody really understands where they come from, what, what the source is. There's two other forces that are less known. They're at the, think the atomic level, think at the micro level. They're the, called the strong force and the weak force. 
Um, and I don't fully, I haven't done all the research to be able to fully explain what they are or to define them, but they are fundamental forces. I mean, think about the, the, the basic element of an atom as we know it. An atom includes in the nucleus protons and neutrons. We think protons are positively charged, back to the electromagnetic force. Neutrons are neutral, and then orbiting around them are electrons, which are negatively charged. We know that if we take two magnets and we put the plus against the plus, what happens? They repel. So logically, with that observation, every atom should just instantly explode, right? Uh, but it doesn't. But that's related, if I recall correctly, to the strong force, one of those four fundamental forces. Those forces, again, not, nobody understands them. But they're there. They're easily observed. They're easily measured. Um, I think that's the science uh, testimony to what the Scripture uh, uh, describes as the upholding and the sustaining of God's creation. Now back to Job 28, and then we'll maybe go to Q&A. Unless I think it's something else I want to say. <laughs> uh, Job 28. I talked about provisioning our amazing ability given by God that, that applies to everybody in different degrees, obviously. But then in verse 12 of Job 28, there's that but, which always should get our attention. And it says, but where shall wisdom be found? And where is the place of understanding? And it reminds us to other familiar verses. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of understanding. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. We know that from Proverbs and Psalm 111, which I read in the beginning. Um, and it talks about wisdom existing, but it's not like gold. It's not like glass. It can't be bought. It, uh, we know it's there, but it can't be found. Um, and again, I'm not going to read the whole thing. Verse 23, it says, God understands the way to it. He knows its place, that is wisdom. For he looks to the ends of the earth and sees everything under the heavens. And he gave to the wind its weight and apportioned the waters by measure. When he made a decree for the rain and a way for the lightning of thunder, when he saw it and declared it, he established it and searched it out. And he said to man, Behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And to turn away from evil is understanding. And I don't have time to go through all of it, but just to give you the, the, the suggestion for homework, the thread of wisdom in Scripture, where would you go? Well, you might go to Proverbs 8, right, where it talks about personified wisdom, and it talks directly about God's creation, work of creation. There I was beside him like a, like a, a, a workman, right? And many would say that's in, at least an allusion to Christ is uh, at the side of the Father in the work of creation. So we would stop in Proverbs 8, um, and we would stop in many more places. We would stop maybe in John 1 and, and examine the whole concept of the logos. In the Greek mind, the logos was the rationality behind all existence. We can tell when we look around, there's an intelligence there, right? That's what John was referring to, using that word to the Greek audience, logos, because logos was that impersonal rationality that explained everything. Although it was out of reach, it was impersonal. And he's saying, no, it's in reach. It's revealed in the person of Jesus Christ in John 1. You could go to the Paul's writings, 1 Corinthians, where he talks about the wisdom of God and that in Christ he is our wisdom. And it's foolishness to fallen man, right? So he juxtaposes wisdom and foolishness there. Uh, that our wisdom is foolishness to man and the wisdom of the world is, is true foolishness. Or you could go to Colossians 2 where it also attributes Christ as the fulfillment of wisdom. So although we're given an amazing ability to extract from the provision, both material and energy, mathematical, chemical, all of that, uh, there's one thing, one critical thing that's out of our reach, and it must be granted to us by grace, and that is wisdom, which starts with the fear of the Lord, which if you consider it in that context, the fear of the Lord is equivalent, it's synonymous to 
faith. Faith specifically in the one who is, reveals the Father to us, who is the Son of God, who is Jesus Christ. Um, that is a profound understanding in the context of what we've all been talking about. He is the wisdom. He is the wisdom. He comes, and we, we all are in different places in our theological, in our sanctification, in our growing to understand who Christ is, and that is ultimately our endeavor in life, right? To know Him, to get to know Him. Uh, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Not attainable, granted to us by faith. And that growing understanding results in a growing gratitude uh, for the faith of God I, uh, that, that's been granted to us, a faith in Jesus Christ that has been granted to us. I had a conversation during the break with a gentleman that we, we talked about witness to others um, and asking the question, why, you know, it's so obvious to us, right? We have all this evidence that's seen in creation. And you go off the planet and you see the planet and you see all of this in this, in this way that I've introduced you to today. How can you not believe and my response was, no, that's not the right question. The right question is, you believe in Christ, I believe in Christ. The right question is, how can we believe? Why, Lord, do you... It, the question is not, why, Lord, do you deny belief to that person? It's, why, Lord, did you grant faith to me? That's the real question. Because we don't deserve it, right? We do not merit it. It has been granted to us by grace. And that is the central, um, perhaps, point that I would, would like to leave with you today. What we know has been granted to us by grace. We could not achieve it on our own, given all of our abilities, which are amazing in themselves. Granted by grace, the fear of the Lord, the beginning of wisdom. Wisdom, who, who is fully realized in the person of Jesus Christ. I'm going to pause here for Q&A if that works. Um, and remind me, at the end of the q and I, I do have a three-minute video that is just an amazing illustration of awe and wonder from our vantage point of the work of God given all of these, uh, these aspects of His works that we've been considering today. So I do want to leave three minutes for, for the video. Great. And you're available for lunch 